Today, we get to bust some myths. That's right, we're taking on the biggest fitness ideas and trends that have been going around social media, the internet, health influencers, podcasts, you name it. Many of these I've seen myself, others, you in the audience have sent them to me and I'm gonna comment on them. Some we've done videos on before, but these are the biggest nine I think I'm gonna go through. So let's get to it. Number one, high intensity training gives you everything you need. There's this idea out there that essentially high intensity interval training or high intensity training is the PERT plus. For those who are younger than me, PERT plus, the first all-in-one shampoo that did everything, HIT is not that. Maybe it's a good comparison because Pert Plus didn't do everything well, but HIT does not give us everything we need. We've known this for a really long time because if you look at the history of interval training or the history of training endurance athletes or middle distance athletes, what you see is way back in the day, okay, in the 1920s, 30s, into the 40s, we saw the rise of interval training where people thought, oh, okay, this is it. If we just do 200s or 300 meter repeats or 400 meter repeats all day, every day, we'll get the best bang for our buck. Guess what? They ran all right, they ran pretty fast, but we can tell from their times that they weren't that developed aerobically. And once, once we introduced more mixed or blended training in the 50s and 60s, time skyrocketed, especially in the longer events, but even including the mile. We went from barely breaking four to 354 four years later based on blended mixed training. And the reason for this is pretty simple. There's overlap between all of the adaptations, but nothing gives you everything. So what we know from a history of training is we need different intensities from easy to all out and everything in between. Okay, every quote unquote zone and in between zone. We need them all to different proportions, but nothing gives us everything we need. The idea that it does is a misunderstanding of the science and physiology and the research. Okay, that's just point blank. That's what it is. All right, second one. The Norwegian 4x4 is the best way to improve VO2 max. Nope, sorry. I get that it's trendy, but here's the deal. Okay, there are probably a hundred other workouts that do as same, if not better than that workout. There's nothing particularly that wrong with it. I might adjust a couple things here and there, but it's an okay workout, but it is no different or no better than if you did um, six by two minutes or 10 by 90 seconds or whatever it is and vary the intervals, the speed, the intensities, the recoveries. That's the point is instead of searching for the magic workout, we need to learn how to manipulate the variables, the speed, the rep length, the sets, the recovery, the recovery type. If we learn how to manipulate the variables, we're going to design workouts that help us over the long haul. Nothing destroys me or blows my mind more than some of the health fitness influencers who do four by four minutes over and over again, every week, every week. It's like mind numbingly dumb training. Okay, you have to vary things up. The reason this became popular is pretty simple. There was a research study by some Norwegians who aren't really sports scientists, by, by the way. And the study essentially did four by four minutes versus I think it was 15 seconds hard intervals versus all easy versus all threshold. And they compared it. And guess what? When they did a VO2 max test, four by four did the best, slightly better than the 15 second intervals. It's a dumb study. Even the legendary sports scientist, Steven Seilers, he tweeted at me when I commented at this, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he essentially said that research, quote unquote research, like ruined a lot of kids in Norway is what they've realized or what the predominant understanding from both sports science and coaches are in that area. The reason that study isn't that well is because it puts us through an artificial constraint because no one does all easy, no one does all threshold, no one does all four by four for eight weeks. If you do, you're dumb. The other part of it is it took 
moderately trained endurance athletes who were doing mostly easy work and then put them through some intense work and then did a test that is a test of how well you perform under intensity. And guess what? The specific workouts, four by four minutes, and to a large degree, 15 seconds hard and on and off, did the best. No, duh. We've known this, okay? But that doesn't mean that's the best. Further research has found, and in fact, some by Seiler found eight-minute intervals better. By Blot found 30-second intervals better. The reason all these differences occur is because there is no best interval training. It just depends on how you set up the study and what your test demands are. Okay, third, contrasting the hate on intensity, let's go with another trend. Zone two is the best training. Okay, zone two is great. Okay, it's good. But here's the deal. As I've covered elsewhere, there is nothing magic or special about zone two either. What the research shows is that endurance athletes tend to have more easy days than hard days. And they tend to accumulate more easy volume than intense volume. It makes sense. We build the base. We build the foundation. Again, We've known this back to Pavel Nermi saying, hey, I'm going to spend the summer taking long walks, okay, to set me up before I have the intensity. Lydiard cemented this on base and foundation, tra transitioning to intensity as well in the 1960s. We've known this for a really long time. But the key here is that zone two and some of zone one and some of zone three set the stage, we don't need to worry as much about the precise zone, okay? It doesn't matter as much as we think. All we need to understand is easy sets the stage. Build a base before you add intensity. How much of a base will differ based on the demands of the race and your characteristics that you're bringing to the event, okay? But it's not the magic, okay? There is no magic. That's the theme here. Fourth one. There are gray areas or gray zones in training we should avoid. No nope, bullshit. It's not true. Every intensity has a purpose. How much we emphasize that will shift based on our goals, time of year, demands of the race, what we're training for. But every intensity has a purpose. This is why even the kind of gold standard intensities, we hear lactate threshold, it has to be at this pace. Well, guess what? The Ingerbritsen say, I don't want to ride lactate threshold. I want to go a little bit below. Renato Canova says you need to push up the threshold, meaning from the bottom up, and you need to do some work to pull up the threshold, meaning cross over threshold a little bit into what we call critical velocity or whatever other zone you want to call it, and pull that lactate line up or to the right okay we could do this with every intensity there are no gray area zones where there's like no adaptation there are no gray area zones where it's like oh there's not much bang for your buck no the bang for your buck depends on the demands depends on what you're training for for some lactate threshold or about one hour pace it's going to be highly relevant for others it's just going to be some support that we do and we touch on it occasionally. That doesn't mean it's a gray area zone. It just means it serves a different role for that race or that purpose, okay? Don't get rid of any zones or intensities. They're all there. Okay, switching gears a little bit. One that I've heard a lot, a lot lately, and you all have sent to me a lot. Postmenopausal women need to drastically change their training. They don't as adapt to easy exercises much. They need to focus on high intensity. This isn't grounded in science, okay? I know it's portrayed as science, blah, 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 but here's what the research shows, is at any age, we adapt to all intensities, relatively the same. Even things like VO2 max, where we often think, oh, that has to be improved when you're young. No, no, okay? When you compare, you can still improve it when you are old, especially if you're a novice or untrained or what have you, but the same sort of intensities and workouts work. Now, are there come some differences with aging? Absolutely. Are there differences between men and women? Sure. Okay. But generally, those are smaller than when we look at the difference between individuals. So if you're a more fast twitch orientated athlete versus a more slow twitch, like do well on endurance stuff, etc., that matters more than if you are a man or a woman. 
okay? The physiology difference matters. It often matters more than if you're 30 or 50 or 30 and 60, whatever have you. There are demands that change with training. We know that things detrain a little bit. And sometimes at slightly different rates based on what you've been doing on training. But here's the deal. Everything adapts, okay? So when you age, you don't think, oh, I need to train drastically different. You think the same principles apply. My individual characteristics might shift and change a little bit. I might lose a little bit more speed here or a little bit more endurance here. And I need to adapt as those changes occur. But there is no one uniform. You lose all of this at this point and therefore you don't adapt. No, it's, it's crap. We can also look at masters women and masters men. And we can see that they're training ideas and start a periodization in terms of volume and intensity mixture. They are remarkably similar in the same ballpark to those who are training at 20, 30, 40, whatever have you. But the difference is often the volume of work is different. The intensity in terms of volume of the intensity differs a little bit as well. Sometimes the density of work differs. We can't recover as quickly, but the same principles apply. So don't fall for this. Okay, number six, if you cross into a new zone, that adaptation changes completely. No, okay? We need to stop seeing training zones as concrete laws and instead see them as rules of thumb that allow us to roughly characterize or classify training a little bit better. Zones were developed to help make it easier on coaches and physiologists to classify training, okay? They don't stand for hard and fast rules. Now, some we tie to physiological barriers, depending on your classification time. Sometimes we go over the lactate threshold. It pushes us into this zone, okay? Sometimes it's tied to fat uh, utilization versus carb utilization. Sometimes it's tied to a ventilatory threshold, okay? All these are, are somewhat arbitrary, like there's more concreteness on some than others, but essentially what we've done is say, hey, this physiological thing happens at this point, we're gonna make it a zone and tie it to this. Sometimes we don't even have a physiological thing to tie the zone to. But the adaptation doesn't magically go from this is aerobic to this is anaerobic. This is helping our lactate threshold to not. This is helping our VO2 max to not. No, no, it's more of a blend, okay? So if you cross over a zone, I wouldn't worry about it too much as long as the whole entirety of the workout fits the desired plan for adaptation. Okay, number seven, VO2 max is the be all end all for health and longevity. I've covered this in depth in another, another video, so I'll keep it short and sweet. No, okay, VO2 max is good, it's important. Now I have a relatively high one, great. But here's what we know. Most of the research on health and longevity doesn't use VO2 max, actually. It used the performance metric, meaning how fast did you get at the end of the VO2 max test? How fast was the treadmill going? How fast were you cycling, right? How many watts were you putting into it? Sometimes they use other tests, right? Um, a heart rate compared to pace or watts usage to predict performance. A time trial. The point is the performance metric overall is what ties to health and longevity. And while this might be getting in the minutia, I think this is important because what it tells you is you don't have to go in a lab and get a VO2 max test. You just have to tell it, do something that gives you some sort of performance metric at a aerobic distance, mile, 3K, 5K, whatever it is, or the equivalent in cycling, swimming, skiing is just have some sort of test and it can be sub max. One of my favorites is to do a sub max test. So in my non-competitive days, all I do is I go out and I run somewhere in a sub five minute mile, which is moderately hard, but well within my capabilities. And I run in and I say, hey, that was about a seven out of 10. Great, I'm in pretty good shape. Or sometimes I say that's an eight or a nine out of 10. I need to increase my training load and volume because my capacity is going down. You just want some sort of performance metric. That's what it is, okay? That's what research shows as a predictor of longevity. Number eight, running is gonna ruin your knees. This has long been debated. Overall, the majority of the research shows this is 
incorrect is that runners tend to have at minimum the you know same rates of arthritis and things like that but most of the research shows that they have lower rates that running has a protective function now does that apply if you go over train like crazy and just run 120 miles a week for 20 years with not much break of course you might increase your risk there's probably some sort of inverted u to this but what we know is exercise including including running is medicine for your joints okay it helps it makes them stronger and all those other things and it makes sense okay all we're trying to do is make sure when it comes to running that we have proper progression, we don't overuse, we don't overtrain, we support ourselves with strength training and sprints and mechanic works. You do that, don't listen to, you know, the out of shape guy who tells you that your knees are going to be ruined. That's not true. Number nine, final one we'll go through, you have to feel smashed after training for it to work. There's this real big kind of movement in the fitness world it's been going on for a while that oh we need to do hard things i write the book do hard things can talk about this but the key here is we need to do smart productive hard things the easiest thing to do in exercise world is to literally go to the well to go to you're going to puke as a coach regardless of swimming running strength training it's very easy to create fatigue it's simple it's very simple to go to you puke that's not coaching. We don't need that to adapt. It's why Arthur Lydiard said, train, don't strain. It's why the famed Villanova coach, Jumbo Elliott, said, leave one more rep in the tank. It's why strength training often tell you that, like, hey, go with until one rep's left. Like, don't go to complete failure. Now, are there times to go to failure when you're saying, hey, I'm going to do a perspective-changing workout? Sure, that can work, but those times are rare. We don't need to smash ourselves to adapt. Why? Because consistency is more important than in intensity. We'd rather have 25 pretty good workouts than one or two or three killers that demolish us and then we can't recover and we can't bounce back. That's it. So there you go. Nine fitness myths busted. Or maybe you don't believe me. That's okay. It doesn't bother me. But it's what history and science shows us. So trust me or not. If you have any others you want me to cover in the future, these came from you. So throw them into the comments. Happy to cover them. And we'll keep going with evidence-based, which means research. It means history. It means what works in the real world. Evidence-based insights on your physical and mental performance. That's what this channel is all about. If you like it, subscribe, like, share, do all the things, support people who are bringing good insight instead of grifting or trying to go viral. That's all I got today. Till next time, everyone, best of luck in your running or coaching or training.